the disproportionate impact that the Jewish people have had on virtually every branch of human activity? Let me start by saying I think that's diminishing. I think we're going to see less of that um, in the future. Theory of Everything. I'm Luis Razo, the director of ASEM and host of this channel. Today I'm talking to Alan Dershowitz, one of the most prominent attorneys in American history and one of the most passionate and successful defenders of the Western liberal tradition anywhere in the world. Dershowitz is an emeritus professor at Harvard, where he started his career as the youngest tenured professor in the school's history and where he taught for close to 60 years. He has represented such high profile cases as President Donald Trump, Jeffrey Epstein, OJ Simpson, Klaus von Bülow, Julian Assange, and a long list of other very high profile cases. We talked about a number of things related to his latest book, The Case for Liberalism in an Age of Extremism. As always, you'll find a timestamp in the video description, but I'd like to draw special attention to how we dealt with one of the central ideas of this channel, the idea that the Enlightenment in general and the American project specifically are incapable of responding to the growing polarization of humanity, precisely because of something that has become the Enlightenment's most cherished idea, the idea that every person should have one and only one vote. This is a bad idea that inevitably leads to increased polarization, and it does so in direct proportion to the passion with which the idea is defended. You'll see that Dershowitz agrees that equality is a problem, and that interestingly enough, even cites a Jewish rabbi who argues as much, which highlights another recurring theme of this channel, the conflict between the Jewish approach to the nature of reality and the Northern European Anglo-Saxon approach. I don't think it's a coincidence that Dershowitz attributes what he believes to be a decline of Jewish accomplishments to the increased adoption of Anglo-Saxon ideas. I will let our conversation speak for itself. As you listen, witness the various conflicts of principle he has to grapple with as he defends the enlightenment and note that there are no such conflicts of principle in the much sounder and wiser Jewish tradition. That, in any case, is my argument. As always, thanks for listening. I look forward to hearing if you agree or disagree with either one of us. Professor Dershowitz, I am in Barcelona and you are in Massachusetts. Thank you very much for your time and welcome to A Theory of Everything. Well, thank you so much. Very good. Uh, I'd like to ask or take this uh, discussion in uh, three different directions or maybe three different topics, kind of sum them up together. One, I'd like to talk about your uh, upbringing as a, as a Jew and what role that played in your very illustrious career. And then I'd like to talk about or ask you if you see any um, tension or conflicts between Jewish ideas, to say it simply, and the American project and then we'll talk about your latest book, The Case for Liberalism. Sure. I grew up, uh, I, I grew up as a modern Orthodox Jew in uh, Brooklyn um, shortly after the Holocaust. I was born in 1938. And so when I was seven or eight years old, we got, as our neighbors, Holocaust survivors. Um, I understood we didn't have the word Holocaust, but we knew that many of our relatives had been murdered by Nazis. Uh, we knew that some of the European countries had helped to save Jews, like... Uh, Spain and, uh, and some other countries and others uh, participated in the genocide. Uh, we didn't buy any German products uh, as kids or products from any other countries that uh, 
had helped the, the Nazis. Um, I grew up as a liberal, um, always supporting liberal values. Uh, there was no conflict between my Jewish values and my secular American values. They both pointed in the direction of uh, liberalism. Um, I did learn from my Jewish upbringing from the Bible, justice, justice must you pursue and the need to do justice and always engage in, in moral activities that was taught to me at a very early age. But my father also taught me not to tolerate bullies and to fight back and to express myself and to stand up for others who were less able to stand up for themselves. So those are the values I grew up with. I was not a particularly good student. When I went to Jewish school, I went to yeshiva in Brooklyn and I was not a good student. But then when I went to college and law school, I became a very good student and finished first in my class at Yale Law School and then went on to be a professor at Harvard for 50 years. Very interesting. Well, thank you. C can you tell me um, what is the connection that you see between those Jewish values and the plight of American liberalism today? Well, I think uh, Judaism and Jewish values have always been in the center. Uh, Jews have always suffered from the extremes of either the red or the black. We've suffered from fascism, obviously. We've also suffered from communism. Stalin was an anti-Semite and killed many Jewish intellectuals, although we also saved some Jews during, during the Holocaust. So Jews tended to be liberal centrists. And that's what I was brought up to be, a liberal centrist, always siding with the underdog, supporting the rights of African-Americans, supporting the rights of women, supporting the rights of gays, supporting the rights of the underprivileged. And those were both my Jewish values and my liberal values. Both are now coming under pressure. Uh, extremism is coming to the United States. The left is moving further left. The right is moving further right. The center is quickly being uh, pressured. And um, I think Jews are often caught right in the middle of that uh, pressure. Today, um, you don't hear people generally expressing overtly anti-Semitic views, but they express views singling out Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people and applying a double standard to the nation state of the Jewish people. And that is the modern form of anti-Semitism. I see. And the, the um, what about the, this, that of course is your, your central, um, thesis of the case for liberalism, the idea right. that the, cent the center not, is not holding. And one of the tensions right. that I see in, in the book, it's a, it's a very um, wonderful argument, and I definitely agree with it. One of the tensions or one of the difficulties I see in, in the book and the thesis is that you're arguing for the center, but am I correct to say that you're worried about the ability to keep that center uh, intact? Yeah, I think people who are at the center are regarded as um, not taking any positions. Today, you have to choose sides. Either you have to be very far left or very far right. You have to either think that Donald Trump is the greatest president who ever walked the earth or the worst president who ever has served. You can't ever say, gee, you know, there are a few things about his presidency I support. I like his approach to peace in the Middle East. I like his approach to this, that, or the other thing, but I disapprove of his policies toward immigration. I disapprove of his policies toward um, banning Muslims uh, from countries that are Islamic. Uh, but there's very little room today for nuance. And uh, that's what I worry about. And I want to get back to the days when liberals and conservatives, both of whom were centrist, could argue with each other about health care, about uh, how far we should move toward social services, liberty. All of these things are reasonable issues to debate. But they can be debated very, uh, very, uh, in a very friendly fashion. You can disagree without being disagreeable. Today, that's very difficult. When I represented the president of the United States in front of the United States Senate, I lost a great many of my friends. They just wouldn't talk to me. People who I had helped, people whose kids I had helped get into college, people whose kids I had represented in the middle of the night when they were picked up for drunken driving or drug use. These people wouldn't talk to me because I was, quote, on the wrong side, even though I was a Hillary Clinton supporter. And uh, I'm a liberal Democrat, but because I defended President Trump, I became a pariah to many people on the left. I see. I think many people would agree with your, with your description of the increasing polarization between the extremes on the right and left. What many people disagree about is the, what causes this polarization. In your opinion, what do you think is causing the polarization? Well, I think it started well before Donald Trump ran for president. So I don't think he is the singular cause of it. Some people think he is. He may have exacerbated it. But I think we saw the left moving further left on American co college campuses. We saw the suppression of free speech, the suppression of due process, 
we saw the boycott Israel um, movement spreading in Europe. By the way, everything that I'm talking about is happening in Europe too. It's happening at British universities, it's happening at Spanish universities and Italian universities and French universities. We're seeing the left becoming less and less tolerant of dissenting views, less and less tolerant of due process, of movement away from meritocracy and toward identity politics. All of this began way, way before President Trump uh, got to the White House. He may have exacerbated it by his uh, use of language and his some of his policies, but the problem was already there. I had already started to write about some of these problems years before Trump even announced that he would run for president. Very good. Well, uh, one of the uh, causes that I think is the at the heart of the polarization goes back much, much further. You write in your book very convincingly about John Stuart Mill and some of the other Enlightenment thinkers. But I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but in my opinion, one of the fundamental errors, and this goes to the very heart of the American experiment and the differences I see between the Enlightenment and Jewish ideas and the Enlightenment concept of equality, that every person should have exactly the same vote. And if you give everybody exactly the same vote, what you're inevitably doing is giving, um, allowing the Marxists to take over one vote at a time. Do you see any, any um, faulty reasoning with this process or, or do you disagree with that? Look, I agree with Winston Churchill that democracy may be the worst form of government ever devised except for all the others that have been tried over time. When the framers of our constitution sat down to write the constitution, they did not want democracy. Uh, they required uh, that you own property that you have a stake, a financial stake in the future of the country before you could vote. Very, very few Americans voted in the elections up until the middle of the 1830s when we saw greater uh, enfranchisement. And then of course, women didn't vote and um, blacks didn't vote and uh, people under the age of 21 didn't vote. But aren't we coming, and, uh, in some coming up against a, in that case, aren't we coming up a, against a, a very important conflict? Because on the one hand, when the framers, um, formed the constitution, they didn't ask for equality, but now we're asking for equality. So there's, a, right. there's an important conflict of principles there, right? And I think the, I think this is the heart of the, the problem. Would you, well, do you, do you think that's wrong? I think it's I think it's a very much part of the problem. There's an old story about, it, about a rabbi uh, and a very wealthy man came to him and said, look, I contributed to our operation and a poor person who contributes to nothing. He said, the Torah doesn't talk about equality. And the rabbi said, you're 100% right. We should not have equality. The people who have the least amount of money should have the most amount of votes because you already have influence in the synagogue by your contributions. The poor people don't. And in order to create them greater votes. So you can take it both ways. Um, there are those on college campuses today who say, we don't want equality. We want women and African-Americans and gay people to have greater voice, greater vote. They're saying white males should shut up and not speak and perhaps not even vote and not be listened to. So um, what we're hearing is a denial of equality from the left. We've often heard it from the right. I have to agree with Churchill. Democracy maybe has great, great faults, but no alternative system has proved to be better. The same thing is true of freedom of speech. Freedom of speech can be very dangerous. Good ideas don't always prevail. Look at Nazi Germany, where freedom of speech wasn't really free, but uh, their version of freedom of speech resulted in the vast majority of people of Germany supporting Nazism. And I suspect that happened in Spain during the Franco period, at least for some time and for some people. So freedom of speech can create very bad consequences. Um, uh, and I, I suspect today that if there were a free election in Russia, Putin would win. Um, I also suspect that if there were a free election in Iran, the Ayatollahs would lose. So uh, for me, the default position is equality and democracy, fully recognizing and realizing that it has real problems and could lead to Marxism on the one hand or fascism on the other hand. But I just don't see an alternative that allows for who decides who gets the benefits of the inequality. So I prefer equality, meritocracy, free speech, due process, even though I realize that all of those have negative consequences attached to them. 
Very good, very interesting. Can you uh, repeat the point? Because I think I, I lost you for a, for a moment there. Can you repeat the point about the, the Torah and the rabbi calling for... for yeah, equality? the rabbi basically said that if you really have real equality, you give the poorest people the most votes because rich people already have influence. By giving money to the synagogue, they can tell the rabbis what to say. They can. Uh, the same thing is true in the United States. Rich people already have an enormous influence through lobbying, through financial contributions that poor people don't have. So there are some who say, let's give poor people twice as many votes to equalize the impact that rich people have through their financial giving. I understand that argument. I disagree with it. I think in the end, one person, one vote, coming as close to equality as we possibly can is the least worst way of governing, though it's not perfect. Very interesting. But then we have the, the would, you, would you continue to uh, insist that one person, one vote is the best way if, in fact, the American project disintegrated because of this increasing polarization? I would have to say that um, it, it would be uh, a challenge, but I can't see an alternative. I don't want to give any government agencies the power to decide who gets more votes and who gets less votes. I just think that giving everybody equality is the best guarantee that the American project will survive, but there are no absolute guarantees. Germany was the freest country, the most open country, the most liberal country, uh, the most progressive country in the 1920s. And look how quickly it went from uh, the Weimar Republic to the Third Reich. It could happen in any country. It's less likely to happen in the United States because historically we have not been a country of extremes. We never had a strong communist party. We never had a strong fascist party. But it's possible we could be moving in that direction. I think the nomination of Joe Biden by the Democrats was a very good sign that we still have a strong center. Um, I voted Democrat all my life. Uh, I could not vote for um, uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, I don't think I could vote for Elizabeth Warren. Um, they are too extreme uh, to the left, particularly recently when both of them supported the Family Workers Party in New York, which is an extremely left-wing and often anti-Semitic party. So um, I couldn't vote for Jeremy Corbyn in England. Uh, and I think that Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are close, closer to, uh, to um, uh, Corbyn than I'd like to see any Democrat. But my struggle, I remain a Democrat because I want to see the Democratic Party remain a centrist party. And what do you feel is the, the strongest uh, promise in terms of keeping the center intact? I think everybody expressing their views. Um, and it's very hard now because the media doesn't express everybody's views. The New York Times has become very partisan. Uh, one reason I started my own podcast, I have a podcast now I do every day called The Dirt Show. Uh, my name, Dirt Show, except for the wits. The wits are provided by the listeners. But The Dirt Show, which you can get on Spotify or iTunes or any of the other places you get your podcast. Um, I try to express the truth. I try to be nonpartisan. And I think the growth of podcasts, the growth of social media is, again, a double-edged sword. It allows everybody to have their voice and allows everybody to judge on the merits who you want to listen to. So I think that's going to be a very important answer. You know, 50 years ago, when I was starting out as a professor, I could not imagine what would happen to America, the technological advancements, the partisanship, the movement of the left toward repression. These are just developments I never anticipated, and I can't anticipate what our country will look like 50 years from now. Well, that's very interesting. That reminds me, in your book, you pose this question, and I was struck by it because you said, who could have predicted just a few years ago that we'd see the kind of polarization we see, we're seeing today? And yeah, no, I don't I, think you could have. Yeah, I paused for a moment. Uh, you were at Harvard for well, you've been at Harvard for 60 years or so, right? Do you remember the work of uh, Richard Herrnstein? Of course, of course, I knew Dick. Um, I, I um, knew him socially, not well, but um, well, I was well, an admirer of his work. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, he predicted this from as early as the 1970s, he predicted, in essence, that. If you create a society um, based on meritocracy where intelligence is rewarded more than uh, lack of intelligence or less intelligence, then you will inevitably create a increasing polarization. And um, I remember when I first uh, understood his ideas, I, I went to him and I said, 
this was as an undergraduate at Harvard, I went to him and I said, this is really, really profound. If what you're saying is true, then the American project will never work. And in my opinion, the, he was onto something. And I think that's what's happening now is that America is uh, suffering from its own success. It's done so well in being an open, meritocratic, honest, democratic nation that it, the polarization is inevitable because what you're doing is creating people who are driven by self-interest, ambition, et cetera. And as these people get more and more success, they join forces, they recruit each other, and this creates that increasing polarization. And I don't see a way out of this. I don't well, see a way I, out I do. I do. And I, I look, I, I, I like Dick. I admire his research. I think he was much, much too much emphasis on IQ, on intelligence. Um, I don't think, I think uh, hard work is another key to success. I have seen in my experience people with far lower IQs, uh, but greater ambition, greater work ethic, uh, working very hard. Um, um, when I think of the Jewish success of my generation, my generation had enormous success, Jews who grew up in the post-Second World War period. I do not think we were any smarter than our non-Jewish uh, friends. I just think we had a work ethic that was quite different. Our parents drove us, for better or worse, uh, they were extraordinarily ambitious for us. Um, they um, made us, you know, really, really, really work hard. And then I saw that very clearly with students uh, of different ethnic backgrounds. And um, so I think a combination, obviously intelligence is very important, but a work ethic is very important. An intact family is very important. Um, uh, luck plays an enormous role. Uh, health, sickness, all of that plays an enormous role. Um, you know, people like Dick Kernstein were not lucky with their health. And my friend Bob Nozick uh, and others, uh, great, great thinkers. So there are so many elements, you know, there's a Yiddish expression that goes, man plans, God laughs. You can plan all you want, uh, but there are going to be elements outside of your control that will determine success or failure. Uh, in my case, I was extraordinarily successful. And then five years ago, out of the blue, a woman who I never met and never heard of falsely accused me of having sexual contact with her. I disproved it beyond any doubt. I found emails that she tried to hide in which she admitted she never met me. I found tape recordings. I, his, her own lawyer admitted it. Nonetheless, it changed my life dramatically. Now I don't get invited to college campuses. I don't get invited to speak at the 92nd Street. Why? Because I was falsely accused by somebody who had a financial agenda. I had nothing to do with it. I did nothing wrong. Just I'm, I, I planned, God laughed, and this woman uh, brought false charges. I'm now trying to put her in prison. Uh, I hope she will end up in prison where she belongs for victimizing me with false charges. But in the end, it's affected my life and I'm fighting back. But uh, you never know. You can't plan for such contingencies. You can get hit by a bus or you can get falsely accused. Uh, they're essentially the same, except it's harder to fight back when you're falsely accused in the age of Me Too. How do I fight back? I write books. So I wrote a book called Guilt by Accusation, The Challenge of Proving Innocence in the Age of Me Too. I wrote another book called The Cancel Culture. I'm bringing a lawsuit against the lawyer and the women and the woman. And so that's my way of fighting back. But uh, you can't always control your own destiny. So I think Dick Kernstein um, contributed a lot to um, the intellectual understanding of IQ and uh, whether it's hereditary or whether it's environmental or a combination of all of those. But I do think he uh, emphasized singularly too much um, IQ in the range of factors that uh, influence uh, success. Okay, well, I would like to push back on that a little, but I sure. won't at this time. I instead would like to simply express my deep admiration for your many years of work and often being um, people taking you as a villain for defending people in court. Right. Can you say some a few words about your this concept of defending people as a principle versus sure. the person itself? Yes. Oh, sure. Look, again, you asked me about my Jewish heritage, uh, the Jewish Bible, talks about that uh, directly. Um, Abraham, um, the father of Judaism, defended the sinners of Saddam and shook his finger at God and said, essentially, how dare you, the judge of all the people 
not himself judge fairly. Uh, one of the first stories in the Bible is about Joseph being falsely accused of attempting to rape Potiphar's wife. We have the story of in the book of Daniel that we have the phrase in the Bible, justice, justice, must thou seek. Uh, we have a portion of the Bible that says the first thing the Jews shall do is appoint judges. And the judges must not put stumbling blocks in front of the poor and must not judge based on person, but judge based on principle. So I've taken all that very seriously in my life. I think of myself as working in the spirit of John Adams, the second American president, who defended the young uh, British soldiers who conducted the Boston massacre and killed a lot of American patriots uh, in Boston. Um, and so I think it's a very important part of due process in our constitution for everybody to be defended. I don't like many of the people I defended. I don't agree with them. I think some of them were guilty, uh, but my job is to defend them guilty or innocent and to make sure the government proves the case beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not easy to do that. I'd much prefer to defend innocent people. But in my country, as in your country, the vast majority of people charged with crime are guilty. Thank God for that. We wouldn't want to live in a country where the majority of people charged with crime were innocent. That might be Iran. It might be China. It might be Russia. It might be Belarus. But it's not the United States of America, and it's not Spain, and it's not most of the countries of Europe. So the job of the criminal defense lawyer is to defend the guilty as long, along with the innocent so that very few innocents are ever charged. Very good. Last question, and I will not abuse any more from, of your time. Sure. Can you Thank comment you. on the disproportionate impact that the Jewish uh, people have had on virtually every branch of human activity? Let me start by saying I think that's diminishing. I think we're going to see less of that um, in the future. Um, I think Jews have become, in some respects, and I use this word advisedly, more normalized. They become an ordinary part of the population. Young Jewish kids today, instead of becoming scientists, are becoming hedge fund managers. They're doing what white Anglo-Saxon Protestants did before them for many years. So I expect fewer and fewer uh, Nobel Prizes among Jews. I think it was a particular, not generation, perhaps century of Jews, probably from the Enlightenment up through um, the 1970s or 80s, uh, when a variety of factors coalesced to make Jews very um, academic and very successful in the sciences and business in all of those areas. I, I don't think necessarily we're going to see that continue because I don't think there's anything inherent about it. I think it's all um, or for the most part, societal and environmental. <clears throat> and um, I think it's, it's, it's changing. And there will be other groups who will take over. And um, when I go to now young scientist award meetings, and I've gone to some, I notice the very, very different uh, ethnic makeup of the young scientists who are the future Nobel Prize winners. So um, I, I, look, I'm very proud of the fact that so many Jews have won uh, Nobel uh, Prizes in every area, ranging from Bob Dylan for writing songs to uh, to uh, Richard Feynman uh, and Albert Einstein. Uh, but I'm not sure it's a trend that's going to continue. Well, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I disagree with you respectfully. I disagree with you. But I do I do think you hit the nail on the head there when you said that uh, there's a lot of movement toward the Anglo-Saxon Protestant um, vision of, of the world and of reality. And unfortunately, our time is up. I want to respect your time. I sincerely appreciate it. Can you please tell um, listeners where they can find your podcast and how they can um, uh, read some of the stuff that you're talking about and writing about? Oh, sure. Uh, the podcast can be found on YouTube. Spotify, on iTunes, um, and I write two or three books a year. Um, you can get all my books on Amazon. I have one new one coming out called Cancel Culture, the newest attack on free speech and due process. I have the book on liberalism that's out, Guilt by Accusation. I have a book called Defending the Constitution. I've written four of them this year. One of my wow. books has just been submitted to the Guinness Book of Records because I wrote it in eight days. And uh, from the time we conceived of it to the time it appeared on Kindle was eight days. And that we think may be the quickest book in the history of publication. So uh, that's been sent to the Guinness Book of Records. I love writing. I write every single day. I can't uh, relax until I've written my 3,000 words a day. I learned that from one of my professors in law school. And it's a tradition I like to keep up. 
Well, that's very impressive. Very impressive. And to make the Guinness Book of World Records would be a fitting end to a very <laughs> promising or illustrious career. Once again, Professor Dershowitz, I sincerely appreciate your time. I wish you the best in everything. And thanks again. Likewise. Thank okay. you so much for having me on. Bye. If you like what you heard, stick around and let's reason together.